So I wanted to tell you a story about uh, my son. He had a goal recently before his 10th birthday, which happened at the beginning of 2022, to build and uh, to assemble a 3D printer, a plastic 3D printer. Uh, I actually bought it because I was trying to escape some parental responsibilities where my daughter, my oldest daughter, was looking to put together an architectural design project. And I figured it would come down to me buying a bunch of arts and crafts and eventually being asked to work on the project over my holiday break. So I was going to teach her CAD, Computer Aided Design, which is where you get design files so that you can visualize what you hope to construct, or in this case, 3D print. And I was going to get her to learn the CAD so that she could have the printer do all the work that normally fathers do when they help their daughters build uh, projects. In the meanwhile, in the background, my son was working on this printer, and uh, to my surprise, and I did not mean to neglect this, I meant to eventually go and help him, he said, Dad, I put it together. And we were just shocked that he put it together successfully uh, and that it worked. And so he just kind of sat back there and just kind of looked at me and said, you know, Dad, now I'm like you with the 3D printer in your lab. I built the same thing that you have. I said, well, you know, daddy's printer is a metal 3D printer, and it's a little bit more expensive, probably the cost of houses, uh, and we don't use it necessarily to just produce things. We use them to do research, research on advancing additive manufacturing, research on advancing this type of technology on there. And hence, we think about the research university. The research university is just simply a great place to work. Uh, I have some PhD students who are here. Raise your hand if you're here from my PhD lab. And they just work on very interesting things, which actually ends up driving the boundaries of knowledge. The world would be in trouble without research universities because we constantly produce the knowledge that is created that you see in your textbooks. And hence, this is where we get off into me realizing that, in this case, Industry 4.0 is the future. And I want to talk to you about how engineering research led to me realizing there was a new era and the need for a new type of educational training program. So my lab is the Particle Flow and Tribology Lab. We're often brought in to solve different types of problems. In particular, we classically train tribologists. Tribology comes from the Greek word tribos, which means rubbing. And when you have particles in between these rubbing surfaces and fluids, my lab is one of the best in the world at trying to figure out how, they, how you can predict their behaviors. But in doing this, we usually are solving two types of governing equations. Uh, one is the, uh, at the uh, top, equations that talk about the motion of fluids. You might have heard of this class, Computational Fluid Dynamics. Don't worry, this is the only slide that I'm going to show equations on. But that top, uh, that top equation shows you how fluids actually move and how, what governs their motion. In the bottom one talks about how particles actually move and what governs their motion. But what I want you to focus your eyes on is kind of the, the first equation here and then the, the equations here at the bottom. In the, what looks like the denominator in these first terms, there's a T. And that T stands for time, which means that my lab is always looking at trying to figure out how things evolve and how to show you that in a different system. And we love this because we like to visualize these different systems. And when your codes don't work or when your modeling of these systems are wrong, it doesn't look realistic. This is why Disney hires PhDs to figure out how to describe the physics on a computer. Because if they don't get that right, you think the movie looks unrealistic. So for example, here's a look at one in the top. is a collapsing water column there. And believe me, this is very difficult to do. We, we have uh, different types of, uh, of codes that try to figure out this. And the interesting thing is that there's several phases there. There's a liquid phase there, and then the uh, places that you can't see is pretty much air. And resolving the interface between the liquid and the air turns out to be a very important piece of science. Uh, in the bottom one, we have particles there. And this in particular one is the powder sedimentation, as you see it dropping. This is also complicated. We build GPU clusters in my lab just to be able to simulate this really fast. But when you look at this together, we've been recognized as a group that actually can figure out particle fluid systems. And so that's interesting because it brings people to my office. There was a tech executive, a tech officer who came to my office uh, a few years ago and said, hey, we have a problem. There's this technology called 3D printing, and particular binder jet 3D printing, 
We know that you understand particle fluid behavior, so we need you to help us improve it. We have it working, but we just can't predict the performance that we're actually going to get. So with BinderJet 3D printing, you basically have three key steps. You have the powder, right? Whatever material you want to make, whatever metal, as long as you can put it in powder form, in principle, you can use BinderJet 3D printing. So you have the metal, the metal uh, powder, you put that down, so that's powder delivery. Then the next step with that powder heat that's now on your build plate, you need to spread it. So you bring a spreader and it comes across, and hopefully you get a perfectly uniform layer that's spread across. Then after that, you have to turn it into the solid object. Well, you've given that, print, you've given that printer a CAD file, right, of whatever solid object you're doing. So the third step is this binder glue. Wherever it goes, it puts down the glue on this uniform spread powder layer. And then that forms a solid part at certain places on that layer. And then the next layer comes on, and you do that in the next layer. And so you additively build up until you have a solid object there. So the first thing we wanted to do is to figure out how do powders behave? Because that's where all the money is. You have different types of, of powders for different types of exotic materials, and will it work in a 3D printer? So we need to first see if the powder, how does it actually behave? And so the way we do this is we look at things called digital twins. And with digital twins, you have a physical system to study something like powders, and then a, a digital version of that where you get the physics and the math right, and you can figure that out. So here's a look at uh, the physical system on the left is a powderometer, and it takes a blade through this powder, and it extracts out an energy signature and a force signature. You can match that, whatever that signature is, to what's going on with the digital twin of that powder. Once you get the energy and force signatures to agree, then that blue powder here is the same powder that's in that particular physical apparatus, except it's a digital twin version of that. And this is exciting for us because once we have a digital twin of the powder, now we can put it in different systems to figure out how it's going to behave, like the 3D printing, like the powder spreading process. So here you're looking at the powder spreading process. And the physical process is on the left. And the one on the right is actually the uh, digital twin of that. Well, we can generate a lot of data of this. You heard Professor Allen in the last talk uh, commenting on uh, the actual uh, data that can be generated. And we like to say from that data, you could relate the behavior of the, you could relate the inputs of the machine to the performance you want to get from that perfectly smooth powder layer. And so we interpret that data with an interpreter. That's what AI is for us. So, just, so all of this data being generated, it doesn't have to come from machines. It can actually come from a computer simulation. So we get virtual data, and we figure out, based off of this data, what do the settings need to be? How fast does the spreader need to move? What does the rotational speed of the spreader need to be to get a perfectly smooth layer? If you don't get a perfectly smooth layer, you have one with porosity in it or gaps in it. Imagine that in three dimensions. You wouldn't want your airplane wing having gaps in it uh, because of porosity. So you want to get that right. Well, once you have that right, then we have the AI, which can say, well, this is how you relate the input of the machine to the final spread layer. And you give those as instructions to the 3D printer. And once you do that, you can get a perfectly smooth layer for a particular powder that you're looking for. The next step is, how do you print solid things? Now that you have a perfectly smooth layer, how do you get it as solid parts? Well, you do that with what's called uh, binder printing. There, remember, you put liquid glue on top of the binder, and then it brings the particles together. Now, it excites us the way it brings the particles together. You may just look at the final part, but for us, it's about fluids and particles, and then pulling uh, uh, powders together into what's called solid primitives. And so here is a look at a droplet with high-speed videography done by one of my PhD students, Josh Wagner. And once uh, it hits this particular powder there, it actually pulls that powder into a solid primitive. Now you have a bunch of these solid primitives that get you your solid parts. Because as you're moving along, you're able to, wherever the CAD design says it's solid, get that. Well, now we have to have a digital twin of this particular one. It involves us solving those equations of fluid motions and particle uh, mechanics as well. And here you can see the fluids of the, the surface forces in the fluids pulling these particles together into a primitive in the same way. Now this is great because now it tells us what do the parameters need to be on the jetting process to get the primitive that you want. 
Because if you want finer details, you need to be able to control that primitive. So understanding the physics and the math helps us to do that. And so this all comes together now that you can print solid objects, you can make something that actually matters. And what's beautiful about this is that if you can understand, if you can control all these variables, and it's according to a digital CAD file, you can make it each time for whoever it is. So I started thinking about mass, uh, mass customization versus, uh, versus mass manufacturing. With 3D printers, you can do mass customization. My father actually got an artificial uh, joint, artificial knee joint. And so it got me thinking about, ideally, you don't want one size fits many. You want one size that fits my father. And so here you're looking at uh, a person running. And as he runs, he has the, his thigh is like the femoral uh, head. And it comes into this acetabular cup. But for the artificial joint of this man, it actually wears out. And so we end up predicting where in the lower one here. We end up predicting where in the bottom. And that allows you to see when this actual person's hip will wear out. What's the lifetime of a particular hip? And this turns out to be important. But what's interesting is that now you have, you have a, a person that's instrumented with the hip giving data off. And we could have a digital twin of his actual hip implant. And we can watch its lifetime and try to be able to predict it then that means that we could change the design of the particular implant in such a way that it lasts longer for that person. Because the, the, the motion and the load profiles that go in this implant are specific to that particular patient there. So now it's, it's a implant that's for my father on there. It's personalized hip. And when you have monitoring of that, then that changes everything. Because now you have the, the customer data affecting your design. Once I realized that, it really excited me because it said that this changes everything because in the digital realm, if you have the design, if you have simulation of the performance of the design, and you have manufacturing, then you control, and it's all in the digital space, and you have the customer data at the end, then that's the whole shebang. So I realized that the engineers needed to be at the decision maker table because whoever owns the digital workflow owns the whole shebang. Because now you have the designer being in touch with the customer data and being able to improve these designs. And so I realized that we needed to be at the decision making table as engineers. And so it drove the need for a type of leader who could assemble this workforce to put together these products and think about all these different variables. And so as a result of that, we saw the need. I was the leader of the Rice Center for Engineering Leadership. There was a need for a new type of training for an engineering uh, leader. And so we've done that. We've done that, and it's called uh, the, the I-4 Engineering Manager Leader. And we created a degree to train engineers who could know engineering leadership theory, but also be what's called Industry 4.0 Project Managers. Because in, in, once you recognize that there's a new way to produce things, then it means that there's a new type of industrial revolution. And once I saw that there was a way to produce things and it was based on the data and it can drive things without humans being there, I began to search and see well, what type of revolution exists. And the World Economic Forum said there's a fourth industrial revolution known as Industry 4.0. And so you have to have a new type of engineer that can assemble workforces to actually produce these different types of devices and services that exploit the technologies that run on data and that ultimately uh, can produce products. And so this type of person uh, is gonna be a project manager that can work with Industry 4.0. They're data blooded. They have to be able to understand data, how it flows and how you can use that information to produce products there. They need to be a product manager as well. And they have to do all of this uh, with an ethical technical heart. So as opposed to looking at just cost and things like energy as a constraint, you want to use ethics as a constraint as well. So you can build a product that thinks about emissions and how it, for different communities, that it doesn't actually uh, cause it to be bad. Or, or whatever it is, you use ethics as a constraint. And so we make that as a constraint in our program, teaching engineers to think that way. Now, one of the things that you recognize is once you start looking at data and it drives how you do have the customer design, it may change your business model. 
So for example, I'm a mechanical engineer, we like to make machines. But if these machines actually can be monitored and controlled from a central hub, like my father's implant or something, I would love to look at his performance there, then you may not have a, a business that sells hardware. It may be a platform play on there. And so we know that that's about digital economics, engineering economics, and so that's one of the classes that we'll have as well. But all this is built on top of the engineer still having uh, deep technical expertise. And so he stands on having a graduate level understanding of uh, his or her undergraduate courses. So this is the I-4 engineering manager leader uh, that we believe that's needed, but it actually came from me working with production, trying to figure out how to improve 3D printer technology that's gonna be key in production in the digital future, and then realizing that there's a new type of workforce that needed a new type of leader. Thank you.